paychecks are not responsible for producing income for the family or for yourself. You can save it, uh, you can spend it, you can give it away, doesn't matter. But the distinction is that most people who have both paychecks and playchecks um, have financial freedom at that point. And then most people who actually want to create multi-generational wealth do, is do so from the playchecks because those, the, those are the ones that end up being net savers in retirement. That's the money that we end up reinvesting into, into real estate or deals or, or, or operating companies. Um, but you'll never be able to get there if you don't see your assets in, in, in that way. On today's episode of the Here of the Hour podcast, Mark chats with our very own Mike Millman, financial advisor here at Northeast Private Client Group. Mike is a fourth generation financial advisor who I've had the privilege of working with and learning from for the past five years. He has specialized knowledge in design case study, investments, insurance, and much more. Today, Mark and Mike will talk about the difference between a business owner and an entrepreneur, paychecks versus playchecks, and my favorite, the importance of your why. Thank you so much for joining and enjoy this great episode. I'm here to, to introduce you to somebody who is incredibly special to me, one of the, the guys who leads our advisory team, uh, Mike Millman. Welcome to, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You know, as a young entrepreneur, you know, I, I always view you as sort of the leader of the young guns in our office, the guys that are the top advisors to, to our clients all over the country. But, uh, you know, guys that literally don't sleep, they, uh, they work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's not enough time, uh, which, right. which not only do I appreciate, but I think uh, the clients really appreciate the work you've done. What makes you so passionate about your job? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think what makes me so passionate, and you know, I, I, I'm sure you can agree with this, is when you're sitting down with somebody and you sort of see the situation change and you kind of see them light up. Um, it gets it gets addicting because that means, you know, you're not only making an impact in their lives, um, but you're sort of helping them uh, see their own future. And I think when you when you do that even just once, it gets addicting. And and that for me is is what makes me what makes me passionate to work those long hours and to work. You know, if we had eight days a week, I'd work eight days a week. Um, but that that's something that I I found really early on. It's kept me going. You know, one of the things I've noticed about you in the, how many years is it that we've worked together from your internship at the University of Miami, all the way through you becoming a lead advisor? How many years has it been? I think we're going on seven now. That's, uh, yeah. that, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a, a long time. I will tell you that there's not one time I've ever asked you to do anything that you've ever said no, and you've always completed the task. I mean, it's, uh, you've got a perfect track record, which uh, not too <laughs> many people can say. What's the Appreciate secret it. of your leadership? What's the secret? I mean, I think leadership's important. What, what's your secret? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the first things that you said to me was that, um, you know, leaders create followers, but great leaders create other leaders. And I think for me, it was has always been, you know, try to lead, lead by example, lead by doing, um, and try to just be relatable. I think in order to lead anybody, you have to relate to them on an individual level. Um, so for example, you know, the young guys that are coming up now, um, that were trying to help get them to the next level. Um, you know, I was in their shoes, you know, at some point. Um, so whatever they're they're going through, wherever they want to be, um, I try to relate to them on that level and and you know, try to see into what they're thinking. Um, and I think it's I think it certainly helped. You know, the the one of the reasons that I think you do such a good job and I hope we do a good job at advising entrepreneurs is because we're entrepreneurs, right? What, you know, you, you work with people from, you know, 20 to a hundred years old, but uh, uh, in fact, maybe even a little younger with some, some of the social media influence influencers. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I was going to say, what advice do you give to, uh, to fellow entrepreneurs, especially, especially the young ones, especially the guys that are your age? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, Something that a lot of people don't figure out until later in life is I think finding your why is really important. And 
when you're younger, that can be very difficult. You know, why am I waking up every day and doing what I'm doing? And early on, it's really easy to say, oh, I'm going to do it for the money or I want to, you know, be something of myself. But I think it's going to be, it's really important for everybody to find their why. Otherwise, you know, what you're doing is going to be purposeful for, for a short time. And then you may wake up one day and it's, you know, not so purposeful anymore. And when the going gets tough, it's hard to, you know, draw from something that's not there. And I think drawing from your why and your purpose is really important. And also just, I think, giving yourself optionality, not only in um, in your finances, but, you know, the people that are around you, who you surround yourself with, um, optionality for knowledge, who can you go to to learn? And I think that's also uh, something that's also really important is just, you know, have a, have a thirst for knowledge. Um, nobody's ever, you know, gotten angry because they know too many things. Um, and I think when you're young, you know, and trying to, you know, figure things out, even though you, you feel that you may have it figured out, um, you know, your mindset changes over time. And so I think having your why, um, you know, giving yourself optionality, um, you know, and then having a thirst for knowledge and connection is, is really important. You know, I know you've got a very big day coming up at the end of this year. How do you think getting engaged and getting married, how do you think that's changing you? Yeah, it's 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 one of those transition periods in life that we know is going to change us. But I think everybody, including myself, um, underestimates um, how much it, it changes you. You know, the, the day after I popped the question, my mind shift, um, my mindset kind of shifted. Um, the way I think about things, it's not just about me anymore. Um, it's about uh, you know, my fiance and future wife, it's, it's about our future family and the, you know, the way I do things. And I think the way I carry myself and the decisions that I make, um, it's not just about me and, and I have to, you know, start planning for them and planning for our future, not just my future. And so I think, um, you know, that's something that it's, it's continuing to change me. I'm sure it, it will in the future as well. Um, but it's also, you know, become part of my why. And I think that's, that's invaluable as well. You know, seven years ago, we were less than half the size we are now, uh, and we've we've had some pretty pretty good growth. Uh, maybe almost tripled our 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 headcount over the last uh, seven years. I'd love to just get for your perspective. How, how do you experience that from a a guy who started as an intern and now as a is a top advisor? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's I still can't really believe it. I mean, you know, it's it's one thing to say, hey, this is where we're going to go, and this is what we're going to do. But to really experience it firsthand from the ground level, from you know where we came from to where we are now, um, it's I mean it's honestly just incredible. And I think you hear stories of on both sides of it, companies that that you know grow very very quickly, and companies that grow quickly and um, and fail as well. And I think the trajectory that we're on is is this is really just the beginning, and that's crazy crazy to say. Um, but, you know, it's it's one of those things that it's, it's not easy either. Um, there's a lot of growing pains. There's a lot of, um, you know, trial and error. Um, and I think, you know, it's one of those things that I'm honored to be a part of. But it's 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 also something that I don't really take for granted either. Um, you know, we have to keep doing work and and keep making sure that we stay on this on this trajectory. I, I think in, in business, it's 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 pretty simple. And that you find out what your customer, your client, your patient, whatever you call that, you know, whatever you call the person you do, do business with, find out what they want and then solve that need in both elegance and excellence. And uh, I, I think when you do that every day and you want to play full out and you really want to um, to, to do that, it, it is amazing to me how, uh, you know, I, it remind, reminds me of the story of the uh, – uh, Ren in the 15th century talked about the three stone cutters. And he said, there's three stone cutters. He goes, there's a group that cuts stone to feed their family. He said, there's another group that cuts stone because they were very talented artistic stone cutters. But there was a third group of stone cutters that thought they were building a temple for God. And I think if you're really an entrepreneur, you're in that last group. And, and clearly you're, you're in that group. You want to share any kind of best moments, hard moments? Tell, tell me, tell somebody that somebody who's watching this podcast would say, "God, I could relate to that." That's a story that uh, that would be uh, valuable to me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you know wh when you're starting out, you come into something with a lot of excitement, and and you're sure this is what you want to do, and and you know you want to you know you want to be the best that you can be at whatever you're going to do. Um, 
And I think, you know, it's really easy in those first few months, especially if you're an entrepreneur, it's the, you know, that first year, the first two years, really tough. Um, and you have to have a strong mindset to do it. My story was that I think when I started, um, I was I was living in New York and I was probably driving an hour and a half each way. And like I remember in winter, um, you know, you wake up at, at, at it was pretty much dark. I was waking up at five, five thirty in the morning. It was dark and cold. I was driving all the way down to here in New Jersey. Um, and our office at the time had no windows. So I was, I was, it was dark driving there, coming in, it had no windows. And when I was leaving, it was dark. And at that time, it, you know, it, when you're an entrepreneur early on, you're kind of bootstrapping everything and you know, you some, you're making like no money pretty much. And I remember six months into it, I was like, I gotta be crazy. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people who, who are, are starting on the journey to entrepreneurship at some point or another probably think I must be crazy. Um, but I think if you persevere through it, um, you know, draw on your why, you know, put the right people um, around you. Um, and like you said, you know, find your client, be here to your client and solve the problem for the client. Eventually you get through that period of, uh, of, of, of turmoil and you kind of see the light at the end of it. But I'm sure everybody who's tried to build something has been through that. You, you know, what, one of the things is I find what we do very, very exciting. I find like every day is exciting. And, and I feel like it's purposeful because we're changing the lives of the people we touch. But I think one of the secrets to being a successful entrepreneur is falling in love with the mundane, you know, meaning that that it, you, it, you executing every day brilliantly and at sometimes doing the same task over and over and over uh, better and, and falling in love with that. Um, you know, makes it, you know, you, you know, makes you execute at a far higher level then folks that kind of don't fall in love with the mundane because there's some, you know, part of that business where you've got to continue to replicate and, and you know, continue to show up, you know, meaning I always remember, you know, it's almost like a, uh, I, I wouldn't, I would kind of compare it to like a, a performance of an actor or a, or a singer or something. And that, in that I believe that if I've put an hour or an hour and a half aside to spend time with a client, that they deserve our very best. They deserve almost like a Broadway show, you know, they say, why do you, why do you, you know, they talk to some great act, actor and he's saying, well, why, why do you, you know, why do you, why do you show and, and try to give your best performance every single time you're out there? He goes, because maybe somebody in that audience had not seen me perform before. And I think right. it's sort of like, the, I think it's the same pride that we have and that if I've got an hour with that client, if you've got an hour with that client, they deserve our, our complete attention, our very best. We need to focus on how we can make their life better. And, and, and you got to do that every day. And if you're, you're seeing several people a day and you're doing that five days a week or six days a week and you're doing it for 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years, you need to be able to show up and fall in love with the mundane because they deserve your very best. And uh, I know you give it to them every day. Um, any any stories you want to tell? Any, any, uh, anything without mentioning any names, protecting the innocent uh, uh, people we're in non-disclosure agreements with? Is is there any, uh, you know, tell us anything about any, any, any stories you might've had in your seven years? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think there have been, you know, there's been a few times where where I've I've really walked out of a meeting and you know have has really believed that I think I changed somebody's life. Um, you know, one of them just it, it kind of reminds me that I had recently is you know we uh, I met a somebody who's employed by one of our clients, um, and you know they're going through some some tough family time, um, some tough money times, um, you know, they probably had, you know, next to zero to invest. Right. So I probably wasn't, um, you know, making any money right there at that point, but I left that meeting and they called me after that as well. And, and said, that's, that was the most painful conversation I've ever had. And, you know, just sitting down with them for an hour, just, I think learning about, you know, where they've been, where they are and where they want to go. And then, you know, giving not only some advice, but I think some comfort um, gave them a whole different mindset. And, you know, I'm excited to see, you know, a year from now where that person's going to be. Um, and, it, you know, it's certainly not, you know, our, our wealthiest client, our best client, but it's it's somebody that I feel that I, I help make an impact with and, and it's going to change their life forever. Um, and so I think that, you know, it's something like that where, where I'm able to draw and replicate, you know, with it, which you, you, all of our clients, um, no matter what phase of their career that they're in or, or what they're going through, 
um, where everything else kind of falls into place as long as we're able to do that. Why, why is company culture? Why is culture so important? Why is sort of why is the team so important? Team culture so important? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's the same analogy as you know everybody's got to you know if you're in a if you're in a boat, everybody's got to pull the same direction. Um, I think every company is you know as strong as as its weakest link, and if everybody's not pulling in the direction of the same uh, values and goals, either you don't get there um, ever, or it takes a long time to get there. And I think when you're dealing with people um, rather than product, that's very important because the message has to be it has to be the same. The values have to be the same all throughout the company. And so I think creating a culture where not only everybody has the same core values, um, but also goals, not only for ourselves but for our clients, um, that's the only way to go to go up. You know, for you know, the, if you tell, tell our audience a little bit of how you see the difference between being a business owner and being an entrepreneur, because a lot of people who are business owners think they're entrepreneurs, but we know they're not. So, right, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things we always our clients is, hey, you know, did you buy yourself a business or did you buy yourself a high paying job? Um, I think the difference between being just a business owner and being an entrepreneur. Um, a lot of people, you know, own a business or buy a business out of one of necessity because, you know, that's the only way they're going to be able to do what they want to do. But it's, but they're the ones that are in there really, um, you know, making all the money, working on the intellectual property. Um, you know, I know a lot of business owners that, that wear all the hats, but I think when you're really an entrepreneur, um, it's not just about you anymore. It's about the people that work for you as well. And I think when you have uh, a team that you're working for and that's a team that's working for you and help driving um, growth without you being the only one that's doing that, I think that's the difference between being just a business owner and one that's being an entrepreneur is, is you know, how do we set up the team um, so the team can drive growth, not just, you know, somebody like a Mark Murphy or somebody like a Mike Milner, or, you know, whoever. Um, and that's that's how you start getting from, you know, one business to maybe multiple or multiple layers of your own business. And I think once you hit that step, that's what's, you know, the difference between a business owner and an entrepreneur. Yeah, we have a saying here, as you know, Mike, whoever asks the most powerful questions wins. What are some of your powerful questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the one that always seems to seems to get people thinking is, what would have had to have happened three years, five years, 10 years from now? Um, for you to look back and and think this conversation was, was was valuable. And I think they really, you know, when that question is asked in that specific frame of reference, um, they really forced to think about the, the specific things that had, had, have had to have happened. Um, and the reason that's really cool is because not only have they may have not thought of that either ever before or, you know, recently at least, um, but it also helps us as advisors because now we know exactly what we need to pay attention to um, for that specific client. So getting them um, thinking about the future and what's possible. Um, I like that question the most. Mm. Talk to me about strong mindset. I think you have a very strong mindset. You're indefatigable. Um, how does that play a role in in, in our business and, and, and what you share with clients? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I think for anybody, um, especially entrepreneurs have to have a strong mindset. It's not always going to be easy. In fact, being an entrepreneur is probably one of the hardest things you could ever do. Um, and I think from, I mean, our, our business, you know, for the people that don't know, when you're new in our business, the failure rates are somewhere between 90, 95% in your first few years. <laughs> and I think. I always say it's the closest thing to death you'll ever experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you probably want to quit ten times. And but again, that's I started to realize that's not unique to our business. It's anytime you you start becoming an entrepreneur, it's going to be tough. Um, however, it's going to be the most rewarding thing you ever do. And so I think having a strong mindset enough that you know you can weather that storm without losing love for what you do, or without losing purpose, or without losing energy, um, and finding your reason for doing that. Um, is is one of the one of the most important things you can do with an entrepreneur. And I think for me, the strong mindset has helped in just that. Um, but it's also, you know, I, it's something that I I try to work on over time. It's like a muscle. 
I think you have to keep working on it. Some people have it, you know, naturally, some people don't, but I think it's something you have to work on over time and not take for granted is having that strong mindset, strong will, um, and, and just keep, keep yourself grounded in your, in your purpose and you'll be okay. Um, what's trading time for, for dollars? What's trading time? What's trading? Tell people what trading time for dollars is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and most people never get all this time. Um, trading time for dollars is, is meaning you only make money when you're actively working. That can be anywhere from, you know, a bookkeeper who's paid, you know, maybe a few bucks above minimum wage and they're, they're trading, they're literally trading their time for dollars or even somebody that, that, you know, owns a company, but if they're not there, they're not making any money. And so I think, you know, you don't really become an entrepreneur until you stop a true entrepreneur until you stop trading your time for dollars, meaning whatever you have is making money and earning for you, even though you're not actively there. Um, and I think that's a really important concept to grasp. Um, if you're going to embark on the path of, of being an entrepreneur, um, eventually we want to coach all of our clients to stop trading their time for dollars. How do you think people choose? How do you help people? Or how would you advise people to choose the right CPA, the right attorney, the right anybody, the right financial advisor? How do you how do you how do you help people make the right choice with how they're going to hire? Because people, I think that's a that's a question that people ask even when they they're trying to hire us. Yeah, absolutely. What, you want to think of yourself um, almost, you know, the sun in the center of the solar system where everything around you is part of your power team. And I think you have to have a, also a quarterback of your power team. And a lot of times, most of the time, that's us for our clients. We're the quarterback of that team. And I think anytime you're evaluating a CPA or an attorney or a financial advisor or a real estate agent or a bookkeeper, it doesn't matter. Um, not only do they have to share our vision and want to be a hero to us. Um, but also, uh, are they able to work with everybody else in that team? Um, you know, for a lot of our dental clients, for example, we have a lot of dental specific CPAs, a lot of dental specific attorneys. Um, so are they, are they experts in their field? Um, which, which of course we need, but experts also can be a dime a dozen. We also want them to be visionaries. And I think they need to be able to see, um, see the goal line or see the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, or whatever the goal is whatever that analogy is um and they have to be coachable as well they have to you know i think you know for people that are are part of your power team you know if it's somebody that that isn't getting the job done you know do we coach them up or do we replace them? and a lot of times people you know come in to meet us and they already have relationships with cpas accounts advisors whatever um maybe those people are doing great work for them maybe they're not and i think you know when you form a relationship with somebody but they're not getting the job done Sometimes that's a difficult conversation to have. Um, but I think if you're really going to take the step from being a business owner to a true entrepreneur, um, you have to evaluate the people that are around you in that way and be able to make those tough decisions. You know, you know Mike, one of the things that I think is like painful, it's it's painful on a level to me because I think we're good people and most people I think are good people and they're loyal people. I think most people want loyalty. But oftentimes, whether it be your employees or the advisors around you, the people that got you where you are are not the best people to take you where you're going. Right. And so so sometimes as you know, a lot of times, like for instance, when we get hired, more times than not, the our clients have had another financial advisor. And I, I don't take any joy in the fact that that person may be a nice person. They may know them from, you know, roommates from college or from church or from, you know, from from uh, you know, soccer, kids youth soccer in town or something like that. They're like good people, or sometimes they have long-time relationships. And, but they're not the right, right folks. And so there is an element level where I don't enjoy taking that business from those folks, but ultimately the client needs to get to where they're going. They've outgrown the people that are around, you know, they've outgrown their advisors. And I think one of the things you're trying to have to take a look at is whether it be your financial advisor or your accountant or your attorney or anybody else that's, let's call it on your board of directors, you've got to make sure that they're, you know, that you, you want to be loyal and you want to always give that person the benefit of the doubt. But I think the other thing, you've got to be open to new ideas because I think the world is changing so rapidly and so many industries are getting disrupted. If you're not on the cutting edge, um, you have a very you know high probability of, of being extinct or certainly having your profitability and your business eroded. Right. And so so that's why 
you know, that that's why you've got to balance all those things when you make make decisions go, going there. You want to right. talk about a strategy or two? You like want to talk about something that you like, what some of the pet things that you like to talk to people about, whether it be uh, high risk versus low risk or, you know, diversifying portfolio. I, I, I talk about anything you want to talk about. I want to give you some time to 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 show to show how you think about things. Yeah, absolutely. Um I think one of the things that we always come back to and I think it's something that um really helps solidify a lot of our advice for for most of our clients and it can mean, you know, something to to everybody um is really the paychecks and playchecks conversation. Um no matter what I think walk of life you come from or no matter where you want to go, that conversation can be important to everybody. And that conversation really is, um, and I'll go through kind of kind of quickly, but um, you know, we really want to set up two series of asset classes. One is called paychecks and one is called playchecks. The difference between the two um, is that paychecks are a series of assets that are responsible for, um, for placing the income you earn in your working years. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be the uh, the income that pays your mortgage, sends the kids to college, pays for your car and, and your gas and all that fun stuff. Um, the other series of asset classes, uh, it's called play checks or free capital. The difference between the two is that play checks are not responsible for producing income for the family or for yourself. You can save it, uh, you can spend it, you can give it away, it doesn't matter. But the distinction is that most people who have both paychecks and play checks um, have financial freedom at that point. And then most people who actually want to create multi-generational wealth, it was do so from the play checks because those the those are the ones that end up being net savers in retirement. That's the money that we end up reinvesting into into real estate or deals or or, or operating companies. Um, but you'll never be able to get there if you don't see your assets in, in in that way. And I think you know it's really easy to sit here and talk about you know stocks and bonds and mutual funds and insurance and you know whatever. Um, but I think when we start to have that paychecks versus playchecks conversation, the light kind of goes off people's minds. Say, "Oh, this is why they're they're doing what they're doing," and this is how I really need to start thinking about my own assets. And it kind of brings it all together. A lot of people when we meet them have this uh, what we call like a, a financial um, junk drawer, where they just have a bunch of stuff. But it's stuff that you know either they thought they had to open or somebody told them they had to open. But it's you know just random, and they're not really looking at in that way but when we kind of frame it as paychecks and playchecks the light the light bulb kind of goes off um and so i think whether you're not an entrepreneur yet or you just started or maybe you're somebody that's you know that's been very successful as an entrepreneur for a long time i think that part of the conversation can easily be missed uh, but it can be easily i think the most important who do you think who do you think should should uh work in a firm like ours who do you think um, who do you think would be successful in our industry and, and, and relate that a little bit, Mike, I think to our core values, because I find our core values, um, not that they're necessarily the right ones. There are our core values and how we live our life. And, and so t- tell me how you see all those things, core values and, you know, whether people should be considering a, a career in our industry or even, a, even a job in our firm, how would you, you know, how would, how would you advise yeah. them? I think, I think anybody who's been successful, um, not only, not only at our firm, um, but in our industry, you have to love people first. Um, and the reason I say is because you're going to meet and work with a lot of different people, um, from all walks of life, uh, you know, from all industries, some of them are going to be your, you know, you're, you're really easy and some are going to be your best friends and some are going to be really difficult. Um, so I think somebody that really loves to help people at, at their core, um, I think that's a, you know, that's a non-negotiable. Um, and I think somebody who's also able to uh, help other people see the vision and see what's, you know, what help them, help them attain what they thought was never possible. Um, somebody who's got the power to influence like that. Um, and it could be, you know, you, you may realize you can do that with your friends or your family. I think somebody who has that natural ability, natural ability um, would be really successful at our firm. And I also think somebody who who has that thirst for knowledge. We have to wear a lot of hats. Um, 
you know, a, a lot of times where I feel like we're more psychologists than financial advisors sometimes. So you have to have a high, you know, emotional and social IQ all the way down to, you know, looking at, you know, looking at your portfolio, all the way down to advising on your business, talking about wills and trusts. There's a, a tax. There's a lot of things that um, we have to be able to advise on at a high level. And so I think when we think about, you know, you're in your right, our core values are our core values. Doesn't mean the right, doesn't mean the wrong, but they're ours. Um, But being able to also, one of them that sticks out to me is being innovative and abundant. And I think if you're not innovative and abundant, you're probably not right for for our industry. Um, But I think a lot of the, uh, you know, let's let's call it people between, you know, 20 and and 30 um, are kind of growing up in this era where they're forced to be innovative. you know, AI is coming out. Technology is growing. You know, every every six months, uh, according to Moore's law. And I think, you know, people in that in that age range uh, are going to be able to harness that. But they also have to be able to be a bottom. It's really easy, especially early on in in, in our career, um, to have a scarcity mindset. So I think, but I think if you kind of follow those those few things that I mentioned, you're probably right right for our industry, along with having that strong mindset. Um, but at its core, I think you really just want to be able to help people. And I think if, if, if you're focused on that first, you'll, you'll be okay. Yeah. I mean, money is never math. It's always psychological. You know, uh, you know, what, you know, one of the things you talk, we talked about core values, Mike, but one of the things, and, and we'll get this, one of the things we, we always talk about is I, when I went to business school, they never taught me how to hire the right people or how to interview people. And the thing that's been so powerful about us creating our core values that we all live by as a firm is that it's made it easier, at least, for me to identify the right candidate. Because, you know, as you know, one of our core values is we not only want to create an experience, we want to create a wow experience for the client. So when I sit down with that prospective employee or even sometimes our current employees and say to them, you know, Joe, Susie, if you don't get wake up every day jazzed about trying to create an experience, a wow experience for a client, you are going to be miserable here. I said, and everybody out there is going to hate your guts because that's how they live. And that's what they want to want to do. They're going to eat you alive. And you almost instantaneously see somebody go, yeah, that's me. I, t- I That's how I am. Cause everybody tries yep. to put their best foot forward in an interview, but you yep. can see other people in their interviews where they go back and you could see, wow, this is not going to be the place for me. So, you know, they kind of want the job. So they kind of hem and haul, but you can see it in their body language and how they respond. And as you take them through our core values, it gets us the right team. Because I think when we, you, you know, sometimes when you first start, you go core values, that's, you know, something you hang on the wall and it's like, you know, it's got some utility, but I think that we have really internalized our core values. And, and as I say, it's not the right core values, it's our core values. But when you have a team that gets it, wants it as capability and has our core values, that's an unstoppable team. And that's why I think we've seen this, not arithmetic, but geometric growth in our, our firm. And it's because of guys like you, and it's because of the leadership that you've exhibited. Um, and all I can tell you is one of the great uh, joys in my career has been seeing you go from a college student to a top advisor and somebody who I've seen grow at every step along the way. And, uh, I, I'm just excited. I, I want to thank you for everything you've done for me and for this firm for the last seven years. Thank and you. I got to tell you, I am incredibly excited to see what you're going to do in the next seven. So, thank Mike, thanks, more. thanks so much for uh, joining us today. And uh, you know, I, uh, I just, I just, uh, I'm so grateful to have you as part of a uh, part of part of my life and part of our team. I appreciate. It. I feel the same way. Thank you so much.